Uh, again, I'm starting all over again, chapter 7, deposit banking, right? That's where we are. So, 7, deposit banking, page 85. And I'll try to remind me what I was supposed to teach and remind you what was going on. Section one was warehouse receipts. Warehouse receipts. When you put your money or commodity, your rice, your wheat, your Rolex watch on storage, you simply, the storage place is called a warehouse, and you get a receipt, okay? The key in a, such a deposit is that it is on demand. On demand, meaning, you can withdraw any time that you want. And this type of deposit is called a demand. Deposit. You could also have gold. certificate that you actually deposited gold. We said that this demand deposit is legally called bailment. The gold certificate is in page 86. Bailment is page 87. And we said there is a difference between bailment and credit. In a credit, there is borrowing, there is lending, there is an exchange between present, good, and future good. And the next key concept was that of embezzlement. You can take the deposit, use it for your own profit and benefit, and then return it before the owner actually finds out about it. Okay? That's a classic form of embezzlement. The other form of fraud is simply fraud, counterfeiting. Counterfeiting. Where you issue, where you issue the receipt for which there is no deposit, there is no gold, there is no rice. That's the counterfeiting process. So that's seven one. Seven two is deposit banking. And embezzlement. That's page ninety. So what did we have here? Well, it's very simple. When you have deposit banking. It's very tempting to do embezzlement. When you embezzle, you can profit extra on top of everything else. Okay, let's see what we have. So, what did judges say? Well, number one, in the case car versus car, the government defended, meaning the court defended the bankers. 
And the biggest of all cases was later on in 1848 that the government declared that if you deposit your money with the bank, it is not your money anymore. It is the bank's money. Now, practically every banking system in the world, anywhere, the deposit of a depositor is considered to be owned by the banker. In other words, when you put your money in the bank, it's not considered your money anymore. It's the bank's money at that point. And the bank can do whatever they want to do with it. Now, when you deposit and the banker uses the money, the result of that is fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking means that there are more notes, more warehouse receipts, or more gold certificates, okay, than the actual commodity, okay? Fractional reserve banking, we said the most important profit property with, for, with tremendous consequences is that it is inflationary. Fractional Reserve Banking, that's page 93. Let's see what else we have. Okay, well, the explanation continues in 7.3. 7.3 is just a whole section in one. Fractional. Reserve. Is it banking? Yes. Page 94. Okay. The first concept is that of reserve. And reserve is an asset which you keep to meet a liability. In other words, it's a cash or gold, could be wheat, could be rice, to pay back or to repay the note, the warehouse receipt. So the reserve is some sort of an asset. It's gold, it's cash, if the deposit is rice, you keep rice. If the deposit is gold, you keep gold, okay? If the deposit is wheat, you keep wheat, okay? So, whatever the asset is. The second concept is fractional. Fractional means less than 100%. The fraction is simply the ratio of the reserve to the, what's going to be, asset to liability. Asset to liability. Now, I'm jumping, it's coming in the next uh, chapter, probably next time, probably not today, is called a multiplier. Multiplier. This is the inflationary effect. The inflationary effect is the liability over the reserve. And I'll explain this now. So this is now a, a little new piece, but it's extraordinarily important. You got 10 coins, okay? You got 10 coins of gold, and you issue 10 receipts. This is the asset, the same as reserve, and this is the liability, 
Okay. And the inflation is here, zero. And the ratio, the fraction is 100%. Okay. Now, you got 10 assets and you issue 20 notes. What's the fraction? 50%. It's just 10 divided by 20. It's 50%. Okay. So here I'll use this multiplier. What's the multiplier? How many times do we increase the money supply? The answer is 1. The multiplier is 1. Money supply was increased one time, meaning it did not increase. From 10, it's 10. From 20, it's 20. Here, if the fraction is 50%, the multiplier is 2. 20 divided by 10. You are able to increase 2 times the money supply. If the asset is 10 and you issue 30 coins, this is about 33%. The multiplier is 3. Is that correct? Should be. Okay, let's try the next one. 10. You issue 40 coins, sorry, 40 notes against 10 coins. What's the fraction? 25%. And this is multiplier is 4. So you increase the money supply four times. This is just this divided by this. So this divided by this gives you the ratio, 25. And this divided by this gives you the multiplier. And of course, you can go on with 10 and 50 is 20%, multiplier is 5, 20, 10 over 100 is 10% is 10. So, the multiplier equals 1 over the fraction. One over the fraction. So one over fifty percent is two. One over thirty-three percent is three. One over twenty-five percent is four. One over twenty percent is five. Okay. So this uh, relationship of the fraction is on page ninety-five. Page ninety-five. Fractional Reserve Banking, okay. Let's see what else I have. Okay, so here, uh, this is the multiplier. Now here, the question is, how much change in money supply? With a 100% ratio, the change in money supply, this is the new money supply, the new money supply, the change in money supply here is zero. You increase the money supply by zero. Here, you increase the money supply, 20 minus 10. 10 is the old, 20 is the new. You increase the money supply by 10. Okay, the old money supply, the new money supply. Here, you increase the money supply by 20. Here, old money supply is 10, the new money supply, this is the liability, becomes the money supply, these are the notes in circulation, is 30, 40, and here is 90. Okay. This is the same as 2 times 3 times. Okay, that's the increase in money supply. And now comes the next very important piece, it's actually well, the most important piece, the heart of the lecture is the following. This is the assets, okay, you have 10 coins, and you have 10 coins, you are one to one. Now suppose, and that's actually exactly how the real world works, is that the banker issues extra notes through 
counterfeiting and the process of counterfeiting is credit. In other words, uh, if you want to borrow, I will give you credit and the credit I'll just give you new notes. Okay. So now comes the next most important piece. This is usually very difficult ball for students and for people who are not in economics to understand that the credit, if credit increases by 10 units, this is the same, exactly the same as money supply increasing by 10 units. So if the guy issues 10 extra receipts in the form of credit, okay, remember, somebody needs to borrow that money. There is no, uh, if I'm the banker, I keep the gold and I keep my notes. The only way you can possibly ever get one of my valuable notes is if you borrow from me. Well, the alternative is you give me gold, okay, but that doesn't do anything. The trick to increase the bank notes is you actually borrow. So, borrowing credit equal to borrowing is the one and only possible way to create a new banknote, to create a new note, to create a new warehouse receipt. So, credit, increasing credit results in increasing the number of notes, okay? This is the same as increase in notes, okay? Let's call them receipts, warehouse receipts. Okay? And this is exactly the same as inflation. Inflation. So, the most difficult connection to make is that credit in a fractional reserve banking is inflationary because it increases the money supply. Okay? So, every time you borrow from the bank to buy a house or to buy a car, the bank creates inflation. And that inflation will have all the consequences of inflation that we already studied so far, including the most important consequence called the business cycle or the credit cycle, which we will study later on, again, maybe four, maybe five, maybe seven weeks uh, later on. So this is very important. In other words, credit is inflationary. That's the very important lesson because that changes the whole economy, changes everything in the economy, as we'll study later on. Okay, let's see what else. Um, now, this particular piece is on page 97. If you got your textbook on page 97, is here close to the bottom. It says, yeah, I don't need to zoom. The money supply is increased by the precise amount of the credit. 80,000 in that particular case. You make the credit for 80,000, money supply increases by 80,000. Next one is the simple understanding that's on page 98. Page 98 is that fractional reserve banking through credit, which is what I explained, is that commercial banks create money supply out of nothing. In other words, let's write it out, that's very important. Banks create money out of nothing. This is what makes a bank business so profitable. They can create money out of nothing. Now, in the textbook, when you open the, in the middle of page 98, it says 
that the banks create money out of thin air. What does it mean thin air? Thin air means nothing. That's the important connection of here. If you create credit, you increase money supply, you create money out of nothing. Okay? That's this little piece over here. That's on page 98. Commercial banks, that is fractional reserve bank, create money out of nothing. Essentially, they do it the same as counterfeiters. Except that, according to the law, it is perfectly legal. All right? So, banks create money out of nothing, out of nothing, the thin air, and here is how. By or through credit. When a bank's, bank creates credit, it creates money. And the bank profits by collecting interest on that money. So I can create one million dollars, okay, lend it out at five percent, and collect at the end of the year fifty thousand dollars of interest is a profit to me. That's the source of commercial bank profitability. That's why commercial banks are more profitable than, let's say, manufacturing phones or manufacturing cars and all the other stuff. That's why you want to become bankers, so that you can profit or share in the profits of commercial banks. Okay? Next is page 99. Last time I discussed it, let's repeat it again. Again, page 99 simply says, that's the first paragraph, that a commercial bank is, uh, again, important, commercial bank engaging in fractional reserve banking is inherently bankrupt. Fractional reserve banking means the following, that the liabilities, liabilities, remember from over here, are always greater than reserves. Remember, reserves to liability is less than one, or liability divided by reserve is greater than one. This simply means that whenever people come with their deposit money to take their cash, the bank doesn't have it. The bank never, meaning fractional reserve bank, never has the depositor's money. It is not there. The money was loaned out. So, at any point in time, whenever depositors want to take their money back, the bank is the bank is always inherently, it is in the nature of a commercial, fractional reserve commercial bank to be always bankrupt. To always, never to have money. So if you, for a second, think that your money is in the bank, think again and read the chapter again. It's not. Yes. A little bit of money is in the bank, maybe 5, maybe 10, maybe 15 percent, but most of the money is not. Most of the money is loaned out. Okay? That's important to understand. That's why if a bank is inherently uh, bankrupt, the most important part to keep the bank going, the most important thing is confidence. People must Trust the bank. If you don't trust it, it goes bankrupt. You gotta trust it. Confidence is the same as equal to trust. So, the modern bank, fractional reserve banking, is based on confidence and trust. When confidence is gone, the bank is gone. Okay, so as a banker, you can lose your job anytime. Anytime there's a big line of people waiting in front of the bank, it's over. Unless you get a bailout from the government or you got a central bank. So that's the inherent bankruptcy. Let's see what else we got.
Okay, the next is page 100. Page 100 makes an important point. It doesn't matter whether the money is gold. As long as you have a fractional reserve and you build bigger credit and bigger money supply than the reserve, than gold, the bank is inherently bankrupt. So, whether the money is gold, or dollars, or rupee, or real, or tobacco, or rice, or wheat, fractional reserve banking is always the same. It's always inherently bankrupt, and always lives on trust and confidence. Okay? That's important to understand. That's page. 100. It doesn't make a difference what is the money. The process of, it's called pyramiding, creating credit or money out of nothing, is identical no matter what the money is. Okay. Well, the next concept that's in 101 is very simple. Page 101. Credit causes exact the same inflationary process as printing money. In other words, whether you print money, meaning create money, just create banknotes, or you create credit, the inflationary process is identical. So credit causes the same inflationary process. This is the same as money. In other words, it doesn't matter whether the government prints the money in the form of a banknote and spends it somehow, or whether the commercial bank creates credit, the inflationary process is the same, and it ripples through the economy. Again, you, everybody borrows money from the commercial bank to buy houses, now, the next step is housing prices go up. Next step is that housing construction. Construction workers get more money. They spend it on restaurants and whatever. Uh, you get materials company getting more money. They spend it on cars and whatever. And the money begins to flow in the same inflationary process. And it's identical. That's why when we study, we call the course Back in the old days, the courses were called money and credit. The credit became too obvious. That effect of credit is identical to the effect of money. So now the course is called money and banking. But again, it's just masking the problem that the bank, again, engaging in fractional reserve banking, and now practically all the banks in the world, except a few banks in Switzerland, are all fractional reserve. They cause this process. Let's see what else we got to move on, so we can hopefully complete this chapter today. Okay, so in the inflationary process, remember the early receivers benefit. Early receivers benefit. So, if people borrow money to buy houses, the housing industry is the main beneficiary. It's the housing owners, the housing construction companies, the housing workers or laborers, the housing suppliers, material suppliers. Whoever gets the early credit is beneficiary. If people borrow and buy cars, the beneficiaries will be car makers, car dealers, and car maintenance. 
If the credit is spent on bones, it's going to be the bone dealers and manufacturers that are there. Whatever the money is spent on. So, can we say for sure who are the beneficiary? The short answer is yes. The early recipients of wherever the credit flows. You just gotta look and see where they come. Now, where credit flows, it's very easy. You know, it's everywhere in the news. People know what they when they borrow, what they spend the money for. It's easy. That's the easiest thing. You don't need a degree or anything to know that part. And the losers are also clear. People not involved in that industry and usually who are on fixed income. Again, exactly the same. That's why you need to learn the chapter 4 on inflation because nothing changes except that credit now has exactly the same inflationary effect. Okay. All right, so let me see how I'm getting to the next topic over here. Okay, well, credit, when banks make more credit and increase credit, the process is called credit expansion. Credit expansion is the increase of credit by commercial bank. Today, or at least for the last five or seven or so many years, uh, let's say in Thailand, in Cambodia, there was a massive credit expansion and commercial banks provide a lot more credits than they get back. The opposite of credit expansion is called credit contraction. In a credit contraction, people pay back their loans to the commercial bank, but the commercial bank does not make new loans, doesn't make enough new loans. So people pay back more loans than the commercial bank makes. Credit expansion is, remember, exactly the same as inflation. And now, that's there is why here. Credit contraction is deflationary. Okay. Well, now let's explain the deflationary part and deflationary consequences of deflation. That's actually the origins of the business cycle. That's page, page, page 103. Page 103. Alright. Simple. Banks stop making credit for houses. Banks just stop credit. All they do is, is when people borrow 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, they keep paying back. What's the first effect? Let's go through the deflationary process. Just like you have an inflationary process, now you have a deflationary process. The first step in deflationary process is very simple. Credit, credit contracts. Meaning credit going down, credit shrinking. Second consequence, it follows from one, is money supply goes down, okay? The third consequence is prices go down. Hey, your house just got a lot cheaper. Is it good or bad? It depends. If you're a buyer, it's great, it's good. But if you own the house, it's horrible. So, first of all, now some consequences. Let's suppose that the credit went to housing, and now I'm switching. I'm covering now two topics at the same time. I'm covering now the global financial crisis. 
2008, which was had a deflationary process where banks cut credit to real estate. First of all, real estate prices went down. Okay, this means the following: when the price of the house goes down, the bank loaned money and the loan was secured by the house. Now, people owe more money on their house than the house is worth. Okay. So, first of all, no housing buying. No housing buying. If banks don't lend, people who wanted to buy a house, they already spent their money, bought a house. If the banks stop credit, nobody's buying houses. Well, if nobody's buying houses, guess what happens? All construction companies which borrowed money to build houses, all construction companies go bankrupt. Okay? All the suppliers, all the suppliers of the construction companies, they supply bricks and whatever, the electrical equipment and anything else, they go bankrupt. All the construction companies will lay off their workers. So now the workers, if they borrow money, they'll default. Okay. So this is called a deflationary spiral where housing prices go down, construction companies go out of business, workers lose their jobs, they can't pay any more their house, they are getting in trouble, and the deflationary process goes on where everyone's losing. The result is major job losses. The result is a recession. Now as the economy begins to shrink, the biggest sector, now real estate is shrinking, they're losing money, okay? You have and I see a lot of fun. So put the phone somewhere out there, the phone, whatever the little toy you're playing with, the two of you. Just put the phone there on the table. Yeah, the two of you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put those phones there. No, no, not to him, over there on the table. You know, no one's going to touch them for the next six or seven minutes until I finish. So, it causes a recession. So, just like the credit expansion causes a boom, and a booming economy, and the economy expands too many jobs, too much money, the opposite is called a bust. Stock market goes down, jobs go down, Housing prices go down, materials go down, car prices go down, everything you can imagine goes down. Including the currency. Sometimes the currency goes up, sometimes the currency goes down. So here, everybody wins, including the government. Here, everybody loses. The bank loses, the borrowers lose, the businesses, car dealers, manufacturers, everyone's losing. And that's the essence of the real estate, uh, oh, sorry, of the deflationary, we call it deflationary bust. Okay, that's the essence of the business cycle. You will probably soon live through it firsthand and see how it works, but not maybe this month, maybe not next month, maybe in a year, maybe three, maybe five. Okay, let's see, I got about five more minutes. You'll have to survive for five more minutes uh, without those phones. All right, let's see where I need my thing here. And move on and see what I can cover in about the last five minutes. Section four, banknotes and deposits. Okay, page 104, is it? Yes. yes. Chapter 7, section 4, 
bank notes and deposits. Let's see what we got here. Okay. When you put your money in a bank, the bank gives you a receipt. This receipt issued by a bank or any other institution is a note. A note is a promise to pay. Okay. And when a note is issued by a bank, it becomes a bank note. And that's simply the origin of banknotes. Uh, we call these banknotes. They are issued by a bank. Back in the older days, many banks could issue them. Now it's just the central bank that issues them. But it's still issued by a bank. Okay. So the banknote, okay, let's see. Next thing is, uh, so, you got a deposit in my bank and I got a deposit in my bank. And you want to pay some money to her, okay? You can use, it's called a check. A check is a written order to pay money. So, you write a check to her, meaning you write the check, the check tells me to transfer some of your money, let's say $50, to her. You give her the check, she shows me the check, I see the check is good, the check is legitimate, and I transfer $50 from your money to her money. So, you are Joe, and she is Jane. And Joe has $500. Jane is a lot more richer. She's got 5000 Okay. So, this was before. You give her a check for $100. Now, total credits and money supply is 5500 When you give her a check for $100, what's Joe's deposit? Four. The new deposit is 400 and Jane is 5100 The total money supply is 5500 So, a check is not money. Check does not increase money supply. All the check is a simple order, instruction to the bank to transfer money from one deposit account to another deposit account. So, just a check shifts the money ownership, but does not increase or decrease the money supply. That's important to understand. You need credit to increase money supply. It is not a money substitute. Okay, so that's the check. The check is again uh, on order, directing the bank to transfer account. That's actually on pages 104, 105. Page 104, 105. Let's see what else I've got. Okay. So I already explained these two. So checks have certain conveniences, okay? You, it can't be stolen, it's on your name. If somebody else gets it, they can't take the money. Checks have certain advantages. Let's see what else I have uh, so I can finish. Okay, fractional reserves. Okay, well, amazingly, I've covered absolutely everything from this chapter. And that's pretty much it. In pages 108 and 109, uh, he just explains that how a check is not inflationary. I gave you a simple and easy example. So, it's important to understand, writing checks is not inflation, where extra credit is. I think this is all. This is absolutely everything. Alright, so, next time, we'll discuss what we'll get on with chapter 8.
hopefully I can cover it in about two or three hours. Three hours because it's a long and difficult chapter. Okay?